Hi everybody, welcome to my channel. I'm Dr. Boz and I am here to talk about the ketogenic diet. I am super excited about this uh, little lesson that I've been working on with some patients for probably six weeks. Um, they have been troopers to be able to provide some of this information to use as a teachable tool for you. So welcome to my channel. If you're new to the channel, I am an internal medicine physician and I am an advocate of the ketogenic diet. I am uh, in the process of writing a second book. Uh, if you haven't checked out the first book, any way you can. It is an incredible guide to uh, beginners trying to understand the ketogenic diet and why it's so powerful. Um, you know, it sounds self-serving, but I really do encourage you, if you're listening to these lessons, these are pretty advanced lessons on a ketogenic diet as I prepare for the second book. Um, this is how I fund it, though, so thank you for anybody who's bought the book. Uh, the book is a story about my mom facing a life-or-death situation at 71. She was uh, ready to give up on her cancer treatment, and I had been studying the ketogenic diet and its impacts on improving brain health while I stumbled upon the data on what it does for cancer patients. So my mom was pretty sick, so she couldn't have <laughs> tuned into a lesson like this, which is pretty advanced. Uh, so the book is a very great story intermixed with some lessons on the ketogenic diet and why it is such a powerful diet. She started that diet at 71, and spoiler alert, she's about to turn 75 uh, and doing great. She's doing great. So I am going to do a couple little housekeeping things. I want to first say thank you to my patients, because without them, this lesson would not be available. I do a support group once a week in my community answering questions on the ketogenic diet. It's free to anybody who can pass the quiz question at the door, which is, what's a ketone? <laughs> what I encourage is that you have a little basic understanding before you come to the su support group of what is a ketone and why are we talking about it. Um, but after that, we love you to come and join us in my community. Um, this is a very hot topic and is a very interesting topic for me to teach on. One of the patients that's been coming for over a year to the support group is why uh, you're going to see his data in just a few minutes. Um, uh, another housekeeping is I am fasting today, so if I stumble on my words, uh, you, I can blame that. Um, or if something goes wrong with the computer, I'm sure it's because I'm fasting. I know. I'm about 43 hours into my weekly fast, and I do a fast every week to help with my own health as well as encouraging my patients. We're going to use some of my numbers later on in this talk, and so I just wanted to give you a little foreshadowing that I am fasting. and. Um, I try to do that once a week uh, for some of the same reasons that we're going to talk about in this lesson. So again, if you are a beginner, please beware. This is not for beginners. Watch and enjoy and learn, but please do not start fasting until your chemistry inside your system is in a ketogenic state and it's stable. But once you're there, we are going to share with you some things that I think are pretty awesome. Um, so we're going to start with reviewing the numbers of a patient who fasted for a week. Uh, eight days, and he is one of my engineers who comes to the support group. I love him. Uh, he is awful of questions. He loves to biohack and study himself. So you can't hardly get a better combination for using that story in a lesson like this. So thanks to Chad. Give him a thumbs up. I would like to know in the show notes if you fasted uh, and what is your longest fast. So I am developing this lesson and I'm giving this lesson because of all the comments in the other YouTube uh, videos about fasting, the questions about glucose, the questions about ketones, and I think this is going to answer so many of them. So I encourage you to put questions in there because I read them and I use them as source material saying what does what is what are people curious about. Uh, if you're asking questions that are in the book, I'm going to send you to the book, though, because there are some awesome ways to begin this thinking. Amazon is where the book is sold. Um, I am self-published, so anybody who leaves me a comment in the uh, uh, book review, I am deeply thanked. I deeply thank you for that. I'm so thankful. It's the only way I get to keep going. So I am looking at, um, I am writing another book, which is where this lesson will be written about, and it is I think awesome. So let's get started. All right, so uh, here is, um, oops, not that one. Here is data from my patient. So this is his list of uh, numbers as he fasted for Holy Week. So he started out on a Friday night and said, this is my last meal for over a week. 
he uh, committed to fasting as long as he could. Uh, and I think that's very helpful uh, when patients give those parameters of uh, how well can uh, a ketogenic diet, how long can you fast on a ketogenic diet? And I think the first answer is, depends on how you're feeling. Chad is the patient's first name and he has been fasting um, and doing a ketogenic diet for years. Um, and he tries to do one of these extended fasts once a year. So this is his data. And we're gonna start by looking up at that top line. On Saturday morning, he woke up, he was 12 hours fasted and his blood glucose was 89. His blood ketones were 0.9 and his weight was about 215. He said, uh, he did his Dr. Boss ratio and that was about 99 and not terrible, but not really bragging rights in the Dr. Boz ratio. The lower that ratio, the lower their insulin, and the lower it is, the higher their chances of autophagy and really recycling out some of those unused proteins and particles in your system that have been there from aging. So he continues on his fast, and the next morning on Sunday, he wakes up, and at 36 hours in, his blood glucose was 87, so just a few points lower than yesterday. Again, all he's had at this point is salt and water. His ketones were up a little bit to 1.2, so you can see his body's trying to, to, to find another fuel to supply the body with the energy that it needs. And by golly, he lost five pounds in 36 hours of fasting. Um, now he, he says, usually when I do this, I'll lose about 10 pounds in those first 72 hours. Um, <clears throat> and you can kind of sneak peek ahead to look at 72 hours that he's about spot on, that he did lose 10 pounds. Again, that's a lot of extra water weight that's in there. This weight loss happens in people who are going from a carb diet to a ketogenic diet, but you can also see that it really is a flushing of, of a lot of water loss when people go from a ketogenic state to the next level, which is this intermittent fasting. So his Dr. Boz ratio is now in bragging points. He's got it at least below 80. That's one of the goals that I set for people that want to get it lower, low enough to lose weight. So under 80, a Dr. Boz ratio is usually an insulin that'll let you lose weight. And it really is, um, it's a good goal, um, for, especially if your first, your first fast, uh, if you can get to a Dr. Boz ratio of 80, that's great. Um, all right, so then he goes into, um, he, a few hours later in that day, only four hours later, he was feeling a little funky and said, I'm just gonna check my numbers. His glucose had dropped to down to 70 and his ketones are now up to 1.7. And in those <laughs> few hours, he lost another three pounds. Um, and now his Dr. Boz ratio is really bragging points. It's at 40. So when it gets to 40 or less, his was 41, but 40 or less, boy, your immune system is really enhancing. You are um, pretty guaranteed to be in an, you know, stimulating autophagy and that recycling of uh, any unused or stagnant proteins laying around. So uh, this is a really good chemistry. If he quit right there, I, that's what I reach for every week. I try to fast once a week to reach 40. Um, and the first time it took me 72 hours to get to 40. And I had to do that several times in a row um, before I could get to 40 in close to 36 hours. I've been doing this for almost a year now and I can get to 40 before my 36 hour mark. And so I have set a goal that I have to reach 36 hours uh, even if I hit 40 sometimes I give in and if I hit 40 I say forget it I'm just gonna eat but um, I, I think it's much better for my health if I reach that 36 hour fast once a week or a doctor and then making sure that my doctor boss ratio is under 40 during that time at some point so um, <laughs> Chad wakes up now on um, it's actually the evening of the third day is about 70 almost 72 hours in three days into his fast it's now Monday evening and his blood sugar gets down to that 68 range. And if you just scan down this list, he is in the 60s or 70s from this point forward. And that's really um, what uh, the, the literature says is that you'll get into your mid 60s and your body is going to compensate by making extra ketones, using those fat-based fuels for energy. And by golly, he sure did a great job. His ketones went up to 3.7. And his weight was now down to 205. Again, that 10 pounds that he had expected to be in those first 72 hours. So he was right on with his prediction. And if you know anything about engineers, they love calculating, predicting what's going to happen and then hitting it spot on. So he was like, yep, I knew that. Um, but anyway, his Dr. Boz ratio was now 18. 
Um, when you read in the book, I my mother was fighting cancer, and so she was on a prescribed ketogenic diet, much like I would prescribe for a seizure patient. And these are very intense uh, parameters where we try to get a Dr. Boz ratio of less than 20. That is not easy. It's, you know, Chad is a, a you know male in his 40s with lots of extra mitochondria because he's a male, um, and then his metabolism is easy to spark and to rise. At my mom at 71. As a female, uh, her ability to get a Dr. Boz ratio under 20, oh, is super hard. She really struggled to do that, and we had to do some other uh, tricks to get her under 20. But if you just kind of scan down that list of Dr. Boz ratios for the rest of the week, he is under 20, with the exception of uh, uh, on the 20th. We'll get to that in a bit. Um, so now we're at 84 hours in the next day, Tuesday morning, and again, his, his ketones are up to 3.9. Uh, he's lost another pound. He's holding steady at his glucose, and those the ratio is um, now down to 16. <clears throat> he keeps going for the next couple of days. Again, Tuesday night is when he had kind of a fit. Um, he said, you know, it wasn't so much a craving as it was I told myself that I didn't, if I didn't feel well, I was okay to just quit. And he had these really great numbers. He was feeling good. And he was just like, okay, fine. I'm, I deserve food. I deserve food. And he like drove to, to one of the places where he always buys steaks and, and they had just closed, like, you know, just like divine intervention. Then he couldn't get access to his favorite steaks. And then he thought he was thinking about bacon and, and he had driven back over to another place in hopes that it was open and, ah, oh, they had just closed. And so by this point, he's kind of gotten through the moment of kind of almost like he said he wasn't hungry. It was just this mental shift where he was so intense about trying to eat that he deserved to eat. And so he had kept Gatorade in his, not Gatorade, sorry. He had kept um, an electrolyte drink that had no sugar in it. I can't remember which one it was, um, but it was a sugar substitute, no sugar, no calories. He usually doesn't drink those, but um, he knew that it had the highest amount of electrolytes in it. So he had kept those in his car. While he was driving around, he took in a Gatorade, whatever that was, electrolyte drink with no sugar, a sugar substitute, um, and got through the moment. <laughs> so by the time he gets to the place where he could buy the bacon, he was like, um, it was, it, he, he was able to drive back home and then just go to bed, <laughs> just go to bed. So Tuesday night was rough for him. That was, you know, end of day four. That's like, boy, nobody would say anything but good job. Um, and his numbers were pretty intense. He's now up to a ketones of 4.7. Uh, that was before he had the electrolyte drink, uh, if I remember the time right there. Um, actually, that, that um, 4.7 was 40, that was 7 p.m. That, you know, he, he went looking for food right at that point. So um, just knowing what time the store closed, that's when that happened. But he's got a ratio of 13. So again, ketones up in that 4.7. The next day, 108 hours in, he's up to 5.2 on his ketones. And this is when he starts texting me saying, is this dangerous? Am I in trouble? Is this going to hurt me? And I'm like, no, keep going. This is awesome. And then about um, on Thursday morning, oh, yeah, Thursday, he had said something about how high do you think it'll go? And I said, oh, I don't think you'll get above six. <laughs> and of course, I like lost that bet within like 20 minutes of saying it because he checked and he was at 6.2 and then he went up as high as 7.5. Uh, but this is a great moment to say what what is what is okay for ketones. And again, it's how he feels. Um, he was really good about keeping his electrolytes up by keeping that salt in. Uh, and his ketones did get up pretty high, but not anywhere close to what I would look for for ketoacidosis. So again, for ketoacidosis, you need to have high sugars at the same time you have high ketones. So he clearly doesn't have that. Um, he does have a pretty steady supply of ketones, and I would contend his body is using every single one of those. You know, you look in the ketogenic world and folks will ask, Doc, why do my ketones go down during the day? They were so good, um, you know, when I first woke up. Or, and it's because your body's using them. They are a fuel. They aren't meant to pee out. You urinating them out in a ketone. They say, my ketone sticks are low. I'm like, probably because your body's using them. Um, that's one of the options anyway. If you stopped making them, it's because your carbs were too high and your body said, nope, we can use glucose. She's, or he or she's eating those again. So if you are sticking with a really less than 20 grams of carbohydrates a day and you see your ketones go down, it's probably because you use them. 
So we keep going on his story here and we get into the Friday, the seventh day. Again, really good glucose numbers, really good ketone numbers. And he said he felt amazing. Um, only I think one night in this whole thing really had a unsettled sleep. Uh, and he's really good about tracking his sleep and keeping uh, um, hours of how many hours he slept. Uh, you get into eight o'clock on the morning of Saturday. And I think this was, yeah, he took his, he, he played basketball. So um, he said he took, he checked his numbers right before he played basketball. And then a couple hours after playing basketball, I don't think those numbers got in the, in the spreadsheet. So I think that 181 hours where a glucose of a hundred was right before he was playing basketball. And so his system um, maybe it's right after you play basketball because that's 7, 18 in the morning. I don't know how you play basketball before that hour. I think that's right before he played. Um, but uh, he uh, had a glucose of 100. And he said, well, where, where did all that glucose come from? I didn't have any sugar. Um, and you would bet that by now his glycogen storages have been emptied in a major way. Um, and so we're going to talk about that as I look at some of these slides in just a second. He did make it till, um, you know, 174 hours. Uh, oopsie, I forgot that that can't be right. So 181 hours on the 19th, uh, on the 20th, and then it'd be 184 hours. I typed that wrong, sorry. 184 hours, approximately eight days of fasting. His final numbers right before he broke his fast, his glucose was 78, his ketones were 6.6, .6, and his Dr. Bowles ratio was 12. So we're going to give it up for Chad. Uh, amazing uh, how well he... Uh, stuck through this fast and then just was so, I'm so thankful because you get people in this fast and they're like I don't want to poke myself I don't want to keep track of this I don't care but uh, when you get somebody as analytical as Chad he was happy to do it uh, he even said look how great my metabolism stayed the next morning after I broke my fast and again throughout the po following week his ketones continue to be higher than they've been in you know probably for several months so again um, when looking at why do people fast we are talking about stimulating your metabolism. So if you look at where did his glucose come from, this is the slide that's in chapter 16 in my book. So for those of you that have your book, you can open it up and we're going to go through that. We're going to talk about what happened to Chad in that first phase, second phase, third phase, fourth phase, uh, and uh, fifth phase. So looking at <clears throat> um, the first thing we're going to look at is his glycogen storage. Again, glycogen is this quick access that your body keeps for the use of uh, needed fuel when it needs it. Um, it packs away that glucose when you eat more than about seven grams of carb carbohydrates or sugar. Um, that glucose elevation is something your body protects you against at all measures. And that protection is a very big deal for moments when you don't have access to food. In our world today, that's a pretty rare moment. But uh, in cases for what, uh, what Chad was able to show us, you can see that his glycogen storages were very quick uh, uh, access to fuel. And it lasted him a good 16 hours. Um, you know, that's, um, you know that, that might have been even longer in his case. So as we, as we look at the other thing that happens during fasting, and he got into that you know, eight days, um, we look at where else he could have gotten glucose, and that is from proteins and fat, um, not really, not from carbs and not from that stored glycogen. And this is where those ketone churns become really high. You can see that the glucose is turning. Um, people get really worried about glucon the word gluconeogenesis on a ketogenic diet. Uh, remember that this patient is young. He's in his 40s. He is metabolically strong. I am not worried about his muscle loss. I would not be saying the same thing if to my mother who's 75. I would not ask her to do this long of a fast. I like folks to remember this is a fasting mimicking diet. So when we look at you on a ketogenic stage state, um, we look at that uh, second phase where people say, Doc, where is all this glucose coming from? I, I eat less than 20 carbs a day. How could I possibly have that high of glucose? And this is the same with Chad. When he started his fast, he was 12 hours. You know, the first time we checked, he was 12 hours after he'd eaten. And there was plenty of glucose. And it stayed in that 90s and 80s for those first few hours. And then it sunk down into that range of 60, 50s to 60s, which is where I would expect it to be in a, an extended fast, in a healthy, metabolic, healthy patient. But where does it come from? It comes from all the stored glycogen. 
And you say, well, how long am I going to keep having high blood sugars and I'm in a ketogenic state? And the answer is until you empty out all those glycogen. You're like, oh, I, I have to be empty by now. And I would contend that the longer you've been overweight, the longer you've been in a state of high insulin, the more you've tucked away into your liver cells and your muscle cells. And to empty them, you need to give a state of lower sugar in hopes to lower insulin, in hopes to uh, then tap into the stored glycogen, the stored glucose in your liver and muscles. I've got some pictures of that in just a minute. So again, you get into fate to, you know, where does, uh, um, gluconeogenesis hit, and I'll tell you, you really have to work at getting into that gluconeogenesis. Um, and Chad probably got there around day four when his ketones went up uh, a good n a notch higher, getting into those high sixes and sevens. So that that would be a state where I'd say, yeah, he's probably pushing. That's where he's getting glucose is the gluconeogenesis. His he's emptied out most of his glycogen. Um, so when I when you go to chapter 16, this is the place where we studied people in a fasted state. So this isn't uh, Chad. Chad started out in a ketogenic state, and then he moved into fasting from there. So he really started out somewhere in phase two, uh, and that then marched through phase into phase three, um, probably not into phase four. Um, that's getting into, no, actually, he, he probably did make it into phase four. No, wait a minute. Yeah, he probably did make it into phase four. Um, again, trying to get that glucose, that gluconeogenesis really was the source of his glucose by the end of the seventh, eighth day. Um, all right, so as we look at a couple things here, you noticed he was doing a Dr. Boz ratio. I'm just going to point out why we do that. You know, ketones and glucose are two data points. When you use them together, they do a great job of helping me see inside your system. Instead of running to the lab and getting an insulin check done, which would be helpful, it's also going to cost you $75, and it's you need lots of data points in order to really understand insulin. One check of insulin gives me a, an idea, but there's lots of variables. It's really a, a, a changing chemistry, so giving me several data points with a Dr. Boz ratio, oh my goodness, it's so helpful. If he can get your Dr. Boz ratio under 80, you might get into autophagy. It's for sure weight loss. That's a very uh, guaranteed, keep that Dr. Boz ratio under 80 for weight loss. If you get in under 40, which is again where I try to shoot for each week, is a Dr. Boz ratio under uh, of less than 40. Not only does it repair immune systems, but it really is a good kind of cleanse or reset. So instead of doing this really long fast like Chad did, I reach for this once a week, once a week, over and over and over again. And I'm pretty impressed at how easy it is to get under 40 now that I've been doing it so long. Again, the prescribed, the best chance of autophagy when my mom was fighting cancer is to get under 20. You can see that Chad did do that. Um, that was very impressive, but this is a prescribed ketogenic diet. And boy, when I say prescription, we are following them very carefully and uh, studying their chemistry. Uh, so just looking at this, when we look at glucose versus ketones, if you look at a Dr. Boz ratio of 200, what does that look like for numbers? That is 140 for glucose, and it could be a, a ketone of 0.7. Um, when you get closer to 150, you're like, the glucoses can be 120, um, and your ketones of a 0.8. These are just examples of, a pa of patients that have had these numbers. Um, when you get it at 80, now you've really dropped that glucose down to 80, which can be difficult, um, and your ketones are at one. Uh, these next two patients both had glucoses at 68, and you can see these different ratios with um, with Chad's data. That it, at first he could he had the ketones in that two range, um, but his sugars were somewhere in that 60s to 70s, and his Dr. Bell's ratio I think was 41. Um, but boy, at the end there it was in the teens because his ketones got so high. And so as you look forward to saying, well. How, how do I best understand or explain all this? Um, I like to point out these are my little cartoon characters for glucose. And you'll notice one of them is happy and full of energy because glucose does give us uh, energy. But long-term elevated glucose really is hard on our brain. It's hard on our energy. It's hard on our immune system. It's hard on uh, uh, our ability to repair any injuries. It's, it takes years off of your life when it's too high. And when your body gets more than seven grams of uh, sugar floating around in its uh, circulation, it puts it away in storage for a future date. Um, and that, that storage molecule is called glycogen, which is a whole bunch of packaged 
glucose in kind of like a vacuole or a bubble in your in your uh, liver and boy it'll store it away and if you store it for too long I, I like to think of those old stored glycogen bubbles turn into um, kind of like what brown sugar does when you put it at the back of the cupboard and you pull it out a year and a half later and it's not really sugar it's kind of a brick uh, those crystallized old glycogen bubbles are something you're not recycling because your insulin just hasn't been low long enough to empty them uh, so the first time you put a glycogen bubble in, no problem, but after years of having high sugars, eating high carbs, never having a time where ketosis is a, uh, an option for your chemistry, your liver gets filled with them. In fact, we find more of these livers lining up for liver transplants than we do alcohol-induced uh, um, transplants. Uh, so cirrhosis of the liver happens first when you fill it with glycogen, then those glycogen balls sit there for a long, long time and they get kind of like brown sugar, they get old and hard, and that cirrhosis of the liver then is called, before it's cirrhosis, it's fatty liver, and there's all kinds of names for that. Um, but then it moves on to the, the liver so hardened that it can't filter your blood anymore, and that's going to be liver failure if you don't get a transplant. So before that ever happens, uh, emptying those glycogen bubbles is a safe way to go. Uh, so this patient's blood is, to, is represented by both little blue balls and those red squares. So the red squares are the glucose, and there's not a lot of them. There's just a, probably a normal amount, um, but there's also ketones present, which are what those little blue balls represent. So as you have both ketones and glucose in your blood system, you're on a ketogenic diet, you're eating less than 20 carbs a day, uh, and you will get emptying of those glucose. And what happens when you empty those glucose is you recycled some of those glycogen balls. Now, your body will fill those glycogen balls back up once you eat carbs or you eat more than seven grams at one setting. And so they're easy to fill up again. Your body wants, uh, wants those around. Uh, so to get all of those glycogen balls emptied, a, getting those Dr. Boz ratio under 40 is a very powerful predictor of, did I empty any glycogen balls out this week? Um, when looking at the other place your body stores glycogen, um, the liver is one option, but your muscles are another major source of where you store these extra little pockets of sugar. And just think of yourself running away from a saber-toothed tiger and your muscles need instant access to sugar. So you were well designed. Uh, these glycogen balls are in your muscles ready to feed sugar to the mitochondria in your, um, in your muscles and just like I talk about in the book these pine needle-like energies, really fast, really easy access, burst way up as far as access for energy. And boy, when you have glucose close to your mitochondria in your muscles, we are thankful for that when you're running away from danger. Um, how did they get there? You had this blood vessels filled with sugar, filled with sugar, and your body keeps emptying those sugars to keep the blood sugar stable. It does not like the blood sugar above 85. It wants it lower than that, and you use buckets of insulin to keep it in the range of 80 or less, or 85 or less. Um, I don't... Um, People say, ah, oh, my blood sugar is only 90. In my mind, I'm like, still, that shouldn't be that high in the morning. You should have a low blood sugar in your 70s. 75 to 85 is a great number for morning fasting blood sugars. That's when I know you haven't been excessively using insulin, excessively using uh, carbohydrates. Um, it, it really isn't fair, though, because if you're young and you have lots of insulin, your body will keep it below 85 every time you look. Uh, but it's at the price of making so many of these glycogen balls that once you do start on a ketogenic diet, they get ticked off. They're sending me messages saying, I've been on a ketogenic diet for, for 16 weeks and I'm still having blood sugars in my 101, 103, 98 in the morning. And it's because they're still emptying these glycogen balls. They're still finding the pockets of them everywhere. Because look at this next slide. You make, you put those glycogen balls in. You've been having high sugar forever. Your liver is full. And in, your liver will make some more cells even to try and have more storage places for these glycogen balls. But these muscles are everywhere. I mean, look at all the muscles we have in our cheeks, in our ears, in our hands, in our back, in our neck, in our, you know, muscle cells everywhere are going to store glycogen balls. Uh, these little vacuoles filled with packs of sugar. And whenever your muscle is uh, in need of sugar, it's going to be right there. So you say, well, how do I get rid of these? And you can see with, with Chad, he did an extended fast. That's one way to get rid of them. But I, I don't recommend that for everyone. Um, if you look, uh, look at all the muscles in this picture. This is for a purpose to say, if you want to use glycogen muscle, uh, glycogen in your muscles in a ketogenic state, 
especially if you are fasted, like you haven't had any sugar, any, any carbohydrates, um, or even any food, just salt and water. Um, and then you use the muscle. Like this is why we talk about uh, resistance training and how powerful the resistance training is in recycling and emptying those glycogen balls, those glycogen storages. If you did, just imagine this uh, this patient doing push-ups, and those muscles where those um, glycogen balls are in this picture, those muscles are going to be used. Maybe in 15 push-ups, your muscles are going to go, "Hey, we haven't done this in forever." But what happens is it's going to reach for the glucose that's closest to the, to the mitochondria. So that's one way to get those glycogen balls empty. And when my gals who say, but I walk two miles every day, I'm happy. That's a wonderful way to begin. But if you're stuck with glycogen uh, or morning fasting glucoses that are too high, I would contend you've got a whole bunch of muscle cells in there that are just holding on to their glycogen storage. And you really need to stimulate the use of those muscles to empty the glycogen storages in those muscles. So this is why I would say on Mondays do 15 push-ups, on Tuesdays do uh, a wall sit for three minutes. You can't believe what that does for muscle, strength, muscle, muscle um, uh, stimulation of the mitochondria, an isometric uh, uh, um, calisthenic like a wall sit for three minutes, oh, your legs will burn. Um, but then, you know, try to pick a different muscle group. Say, you know, could you do um, um, supermans for, um, for three minutes on Wednesday and then a different one on Thursday. Again, what you're doing is you're stimulating the use of a different muscle group. Not for two hours in the gym, just enough to turn on those, those mitochondria. And that is the beginning of how do we repair and how do we empty these mitochondria. Um, one of the one of the most powerful reasons I recommend I think we're good here oh we can empty the glycogen balls here by uh, watching those glucose go into the circulation and again that's what happens in ketosis to get them further emptied that's when we want to use those muscle cells so I hope that was helpful um, we do have um, um, quite a few uh, um, other lectures that I've used those slides in and I just really like to, to show how and why do we use fasting in a ketogenic state and what really is that doing at a chemical level. Um, you can see that Chad chooses to do his fasts once a year and he is really intense about it and I am super thankful that I got to capture all that data uh, and put it in this uh, show for you so a kudos to Chad for doing that for us. Uh, the second thing I usually get is, Doc, what do you do during a fast? What do you what do you what do you consume? And the answer is, I I have I've been in different chapters, uh, and I think this is again the the art of fasting is really a skill. Um, I will first put out that when I fast, I have to have a reason that I'm fasting. I have to have a mindfulness about why I'm denying myself food, and it can't just be, oh, I do it every week. No, I have, I've tried that and I, I fail. As soon as I get hungry, I'm like, nah, forget it. This week is just a pass. And uh, so I don't like to do that. I, I, I like to succeed at this. And um, I found that if I have a mental uh, meditation or a prayer or somebody else that I'm thinking about or a patient or a, I've had some, you know, some tragedies in our family recently and um, just tough chapters and you say, I'm just going to use that as my main, my focus whenever I get hungry or whenever I think of giving up. Um, otherwise, I try to stick with water and salt. Uh, you know, those salt crystals are really important. Uh, you will, you are, it's amazing how much you flush out those first few hours of a fast, even when I do this every week. Um, if I'm having a tough time getting past my 36 hours, I will do a float. Uh, this is a type in Epson float spa or float spa. Uh, and I'll do that right before when I usually would have supper, I'll try to have my float and then I'll go home and go to bed. <laughs> and that's the best way to stay out of the kitchen. Um, but that toughest time for me is like I start my fast on Sundays before I do um, broadcast. And then on Monday is my real fast day. So it's Monday night that is the toughest for me. Um, and then the other thing I've done is um, I use black coffee in the morning and then I don't like the feeling of the coffee as the day goes on. So I use um, some fasting teas. Uh, this is one of my favorites um, and you'll find that in the show notes. Um, it's just an interesting way of putting the most antioxidants in a tea and it's, um, it's easy. <laughs> it's just uh, the sprinkles in a tea that um, uh, are, they are freeze dried. So they're, um, the, the 
first of all, the tea leaves were, are really good. I don't really like tea, so this has been one of the places where I like the one that's got some ginger in it. It's got a nice flavor, uh, and uh, I know tea is acquired, so the first few times I'm like, okay, it's not my coffee, but I was super happy that I didn't, like, I couldn't do coffee, you know, in the evenings, I would just not sleep. So that's a big warning sign for me and my kids if I'm not sleeping. So I've really been a fan of just every time I do a fast, I prepare. In fact, usually on Sundays during my, my broadcast, I'm drinking one of those teas because I don't want to have coffee. Um, the other thing that I, I did early in the in my fasting uh, samples was I did bone broth. And again, there's a really great bone broth recipe in here. Um, it has uh, guaranteed to be gelatinous. Now that sounds really gross until you're trying to say, no, I only get a fourth of a cup when I am fasting and it needs to be nice and salty, but it also needs to have just enough nutrients that I could feel like I wasn't deprived. And for the first probably four months that I did this fast every week, my family would still eat on Monday nights. <laughs> and as a mother of teenagers, uh, my, we would have food, but I, I would try to have the cup, my, or a cup of this bone broth and have it nice and hot and salty and that's how I'd get through that meal. Um, and the, eventually, <laughs> at first, I had so much bone broth that I think I smelled it on me for a couple days after each fast, like it was weird. But uh, now I really feel like I've kind of mastered that ability to not uh, say yes to uh, even the salty bone broth. I just don't do that anymore. But I did for probably six months, and that's just, that's all I could do. That was the best fast I could give myself, and my numbers were still pretty good. I was still testing and getting to that ratio of 40 or less, and then each month I it would take me a shorter amount of time to get to that Dr. Boss ratio of under 40. Um, you know, in a, when I'm feeling badly, if, I, if I'm in a fast and I want to break the fast, um, I don't have much resistance of doing that anymore. But the other thing that I would have done differently if I, knowing what I know now, uh, as opposed to when I wrote that book, is that I would have used supplemental BHB. Um, if, I, if I was fasting and I just couldn't, I wanted to give up. Um, what adding supplemental BHB, uh, which is beta-hydroxybutyrate, this is a, you know, a bioidentical chemical that your body makes, it's a ketone, it's like ketones in a can is what I like to call it. So they're ready-made, your body doesn't have to do anything, it's, it is in your blood within like four minutes of taking the supplement. And it, it is a time when your, your need for ketones are high, but your mitochondria can't keep up. They're not good enough at making them as fast as you're asking them to do it. And um, this was really helpful for a few of my patients that they really need to, to get rid of glycogen. And so I don't want them putting any sugar, but the energy lull that their body was going through because they couldn't make the ketones as fast as their body was asking for them. Boy, we did that for like four of their fasts uh, each week, four weeks, like a month of their fasting. And it would just be a, a little shot glass full of like some heavy whipping cream and a little of this uh, BHB. Um, and we'd put it in their supplement and it would get them through that moment. First of all, it's so fast. Like you, they would check their sugars within like three minutes, four minutes of taking the supplement. And they're like, oh my gosh, my ketones are like four. Am I going to die? I'm like, no, that was the point. That's what we're trying to do. And at first they probably couldn't use that many at once. And so maybe they peed a few out. But eventually what was happening is they were able, their mitochondria were turning on one little layer at a time. And now they don't need anything. But I contend that they were really struggling. They probably couldn't have gotten through that fast uh, learning curve, that fasting learning curve, without a little help. And, and they were metabolically in danger. They were having a tough time. They were type 2 diabetic. They were struggling. Um, and so I really think that that bridge for those patients has been a very good way for them to get to their Dr. Boz. Now, you don't get to count the Dr. Boz ratio for four hours after you take a supplement because that's just my, that's just the, <laughs> That's just the supplement. It doesn't, it doesn't count. So give yourself four hours and then you can check to see where your body ended up. But I just am very impressed at how much it's helped some of those patients. All right, so I think that gives you a pretty good rounded uh, summary on extended fasts and what they look like and what are the ups and downs and what are what are some numbers for glucose and for ketones. Um, there's a couple other lectures out there that where I go through the chemistry of what happens during a fast. That's a really good video to watch after seeing uh, Chad's example of a eight-day fast. 
All right. Once again, thank you. And thanks to all of you that have written a review. People write in all the time saying, how can I help your channel? How can I support your channel? And of course, a book review is golden. Uh, any Buddy that you know that would benefit from the ketogenic diet, buy them a book, share the book. It's absolutely my favorite way for you to say thank you. So signing off is Dr. Vaz. Until next time, we are helping your health one ketone at a time.